Uh, ready to start? Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. So uh, my name is uh, Graham Newbig. I'm an assistant professor at the Language Technologies Institute. Um, I will be doing the class today. Uh, so this is, I think, a general purpose deep learning class, but you've, you guys have covered like sequence sequence or sequence generation models and stuff like that, right? So I'm, I'm going to be talking about some topics uh, regarding properly training uh, sequence generation models. And it aims to be a kind of like first high level overview of some of the problems that you encounter when training these models. And also uh, some of the ways you can fix some of these problems. Um, if there's anything that you guys have covered already, I obviously haven't been here for the whole class, so I, I might be repeating stuff. So if, I'll, I'll try to ask, but just tell me, you know, hey, we know that all, all this already. So, um, so basically, um, the first thing uh, that is kind of important for understanding this class is there's lots of different types of prediction that you can be doing. Um, you know, most uh, learning or deep learning, you know, whatever, is, uh, has to do with taking in an input and predicting an output. And um, the kind of simplest version of this is uh, binary classification, uh, where you take in, let's say, a sentence. It could be an image or whatever else. And you try to predict between two labels, uh, you know, a yes label and a no label. Um, one of the examples I'm giving here is uh, positive versus negative sentiment. Um, another one is multi-class classification, um, where you have uh, an input and you want to give it multiple labels. So this could be you know, very good, good, neutral, bad, very bad. Um, it could be all the classes in ImageNet. Uh, you know, it could be uh, anything else. Um, the important thing here is this is a fixed number of classes that you're trying to predict over. And then the final one is um, where you have an exponential or infinite number of labels or a variable number of labels depending on the size of the input. So um, one example of this would be to go from the sentence and turn it into uh, part of speech tags over each word. Another example would be to go into this, uh, to take the sentence and translate it into another language, for example. Um, and the reason why I say ex exponential or infinite number is, um, let's say there's uh, 50 part of speech tags that you could possibly be predicting, and you need to predict one for each word. Or let's say there's uh, 10,000 words in your vocabulary. How many classes do you have for each of these examples? Any ideas? For the first one, you need one, you need one part of speech tag for each word, and you have 50 possible part of speech tags. Yeah, exactly. So it'd be 50 to the 4. So that sounds, that sounds pretty scary, right? You know, if you have uh, lots and lots of them. Uh, what about the second one? Similarly, like the size of the vocab in which we are trying to predict. Mm -hmm. So um, this is close, but not, uh, but not exactly right. So in translation, you don't necessarily have to have the same number of words in the output, right? So in fact, it's unlikely, but let's say you had an infinitely long sentence resulting from uh, translating a finitely long input, you could have an infinite number of outputs. So basically, either way, it's unmanageable once you start getting into longer sequences. Um, so what we have to do is we have to do structured prediction. So structured prediction basically says, I'm not going to try to predict all of the classes like we did for multi-class classification, but we're trying to um, uh, predict uh, you know, maybe one step at a time, for example. And that's what we did in an encoder-decoder model, right? You know, we would predict the next word, we'd predict the next word, we'd predict the next word. So I'm going to talk about uh, this particular type of prediction. Um, and our model. Um, is going to be some uh, type of autoaggressive uh, neural network. So basically, we have an encoder uh, that we take in an input, um, and then uh, we try to predict the words one at a time. And because we try to predict the words one at a time, while we do have an infinite number of pot potential outputs, each particular prediction we do is finite size, right? So each particular prediction we do is limited by the size of the vocabulary. Um, so this is a very wide class of models. This isn't every single model that we handle in deep learning. So, you know, um, there's lots of uh, models that don't predict this way, like you know, traditional GANs, for example, deconvolution, 
Um, you've covered these things here? Okay. So like th those type of models aren't taking in the pre previous prediction and making a prediction on the output side. Um, but there are lots of models uh, that do this, like neural networks, uh, traditional transformer models. Did you cover non-autoaggressive sequence generation? Maybe not. No? Okay. Well, it's not super important, but um, you know, there, there's lots of different uh, models, uh, but this is the particular one we're going to talk about. And we have the encoder and we have the decoder. Um, so the standard uh, machine translation system uh, or sequence sequence language generation sequence generation system uh, training and decoding algorithm um, basically uh, the decoder structure looks like this the encoder actually doesn't matter at all uh, for the purpose of what I'm going to be talking about you could be using any encoder that you want um, and in fact the um, the instantiation of the arrows here actually doesn't matter a whole lot either. So like this could be a recurrent neural network, it could be a transformer, it could be an LSTM, it could be you know, a regular feed-forward neural network. I don't really care. The important thing is we have a model that takes in the input of the encoder um, and then one at a time predicts the words. And based on predicting the previous word, it then calculates a representation which is used to uh, generate the next word. So um, if we get the probability, uh, if we look at how uh, this creates the probability of the sentence, basically this is the input. Uh, I'm calling the input F here. Uh, this is kind of like a historical thing from machine translation. Um, it'd probably be better to call it X and Y, uh, which is probably what you're more familiar with. Um, but we have the, uh, the input F, the output E, and we, um, and we calculate the probability of the next word, and we multiply all of them together. So this, this should look familiar. Um, another really important thing here is this is not an approximation. This is an exact formula for calculating the probability of the, um, of the output sentence. It just uh, works for math uh, statistics, you know, the chain rule. Um, so based on this, uh, what we can do is then we can do maximum likelihood training. Um, and in the maximum likelihood training, basically uh, we maximize the likelihood of uh, predicting the next word in the reference given the previous words. And the way we do this is we define the loss function being the log probability of the output. And, um, and then the, uh, we can do this by summing the log probabilities, or the, uh, I guess I'm using the negative log probability here because it's a loss function and we want lower to be better. Um, and we do this by summing the log probabilities over the next word in the sequence. So this also looks familiar, right? So this is background that I need to, um, to build up here. So this is, um, this is really important. Um, and this is not the only way to do things. So like I talked about the autoregressive um, factorization. Um, the autoregressive factorization is an exact factorization. It's kind of, you know, quote unquote correct. Um, this is not the only uh, way we should necessarily be doing things, and I'm going to be talking about different ways to be doing things here. Um, so this is also, um, this way of training um, models is also called teacher forcing. And the reason why it's called teacher forcing is basically um, every time we predict the next word in the true output, we are inputting the correct word uh, of the previous output. Um, and this is in contrast to what we do at testing time. Because in testing time, we don't know the correct output, right? So because in testing time, we don't know the correct output, um, there's no way we can feed in you know, the correct E1 through E t minus 1. Uh, so we're not actually going to be able to calculate this quantity when we're actually generating outputs. Um, so what kind of problems does this cause? Um, the biggest problem that this causes is something that has been labeled uh, exposure bias. Uh, this term is actually relatively new. This, uh, this term apparently uh, was in, invented by uh, uh, Marco Leo Ranzato and others in 2015. I thought it was an older term, but it's actually uh, fairly recent. Um, but basically the problem is um, because you're assuming you're feeding in the correct previous input, um, but at test time you might make mistakes, um, 
once you start making mistakes, you tend to continue making mistakes. You have error propagation that goes all the way from the beginning of the you know, sequence to the end of the sequence. Um, and because the model is not exposed to mistakes during training time, it cannot deal with them at test time. Um, so this is uh, so this is a problem. The second problem is that this model, um, that this method doesn't. Um, uh, sorry, I'm reusing some slides that I presented at a translation place. So, <laughs> like, replace translations with outputs, and everything should be you know uh, um, the same. But in the end, we want good outputs, and um, we have some kind of measures of good outputs for you know sequ generated sequences. So the ultimate measure of a good output is whether a human likes it or not, or whether it's useful in whatever task you're trying to do. Um, what is not a measure of good output is you know, its likelihood according to the model, right? Um, so what we want to do in the end is we want to be able to generate an output or maybe multiple outputs. I don't actually know. But we have measures of how good these outputs are, and we would like to be optimizing these measures. Um, and the important thing is when you're optimizing the likelihood, uh, some mistaken uh, predictions uh, will cause these metrics to be much worse than others. Um, so I would like to have, like, right up here, three important concepts. Um, and the important concepts are, uh, are as follows. The first one is uh, model error. Uh, the second one is uh, search error. And the final one is an evaluation error. So in order to define all of these, um, I'm going to assume that we have, uh, I'm going to write a few definitions. Um, the first one is uh, we have an input x. We have a, um, let's say, a correct output y. It, there might not only be one correct output, but we have a, a reference output. Maybe it was a translation that was created by a human translator. Maybe it is a dialogue response that somebody actually said in that particular context. Um, what other sequence generation tasks have you guys done? Have you done like image captioning, seen image captioning, or speech recognition, or something like that? OK, sure. So there, there would be the actual transcript created by a human, right? Um, so correct, I'll do quote correct output. And um, I'll do uh, model generated output. So um, the first definition I want to define is um, an evaluation error, or is let, let's say evaluation in the first place. So let's say we have an evaluation function, um, and that takes in. Um, It has three inputs. Um, the input in the output and the um, in the sorry the input the quote unquote correct output or the reference output um, and the model generated output and usually. Um, Usually, we don't consider the input when we're uh, calculating this. So let's say the input is optional. And we can have um, uh, this. Maybe y, maybe x. 
Um, this eraser is really horrible, sorry. I feel like I'm doing like the crossword puzzle with a ballpoint pen or something like this. I can't make any mistakes, otherwise I'll be scarred for life. Um, so, the, uh, so we have an evaluation function here. And the evaluation function um, for your uh, speech recognition assignment would be word uh, error rate, I guess, or one minus word error rate because you want the evaluation function to be higher. Um, and that's what you actually want to be optimizing. Um, but who said word error rate is a good metric in the first place, right? other than you know, the person who gave you the assignment and said you need to increase word error rate, otherwise you don't get a good grade. So um, you know, word error rate might be a good metric, it might not be a good metric. Um, I could think of, uh, for, and for speech recognition, actually word error rate is pretty reasonable. You know, there's not that many different uh, ways you could recognize a sentence and um, word error rate is pretty intuitive. But let's say you have translation. In translation there's, a thousand different ways you could translate a sentence correctly, right? And your uh, correct reference output is only a single, is only one of them. So you can come up with examples where you translate, um, for example, uh, my, my best friend is a dog and I love him. Um, and so that, that's one correct translation of the input. And uh, you could also translate it as, I'm really infatuated with my canine best friend, or something like that. So these are two things. They mean virtually the same thing. But you know, if you put them into any sort of thing that looked at the surface level similarity between these, um, you might not do a good job. So for something like translation, you have blue score. And um, the blue score basically looks at, so have you talked about what blue score is here? Maybe not? OK. Basically what it does is it looks at how many words overlap in the output, um, and then how many uh, bigrams overlap in the output, how many two-word uh, uh, phrases, how many three-word phrases, how many four-word phrases. And the blue score for that output that I talked about would be really abysmal. It would be horrible. Um, so what you actually want is you want something that's useful downstream. For machine translation, it's a good translation. Um, so you kind of have this like eval, uh, star, which is like what you actually want to be optimizing. You actually want good translations. You actually want speech recognition results. Um, let's say you're Google and you're using speech recognition for search. You actually want um, speech recognition results that give you good search results. So if that's the case, you might not matter. You might not care about whether you messed up it and it, uh, it is and its. Uh, because you know the downstream search engine will do fine normalizing over those mistakes. Um, so evaluation error is basically the fact that the thing that you can evaluate easily is not the thing that you actually want to be evaluating. Um, so this is, uh, this is a big problem. Um, I'm not going to be talking a huge amount about this problem here, but um, the important thing is that we remember this, that this is a problem uh, for next time. So now the, um, the second thing is model error. So what is model error? In model error is basically we have probability, um, or no, sorry. So what we're doing at the end of the day is we are generating um, outputs. And the standard way of doing this Is, uh, is doing something like this. Um, so you have some sort of score. Very often the score is just the conditional probability of the output, but that's not the only option, which is why I wrote S instead of P. Um, but uh, very often this, uh, so this is how you generate your outputs most of the time. Um, and the concept of model error is that we also have
So we have some sort of um, Y star that gives you a good evaluation score. It's like a good output, right? Um, and once you have this Y star, um, what you would like is you would like your model to give high scores to things that give you high evaluation scores, right? You would like your model to be able to pr accurately predict what gives you a high evaluation score. And um, the idea of a model error is when your model, um, let's say your model is parameterized by theta or something like this. This is a you know, parameterized model. When this parameterized model is, um, uh, is not giving you good outputs. And this is what you spend most of your time thinking about, right, in this class. You come up with better models that give you better scores that are more correlated with the high quality of the outputs. And then the final, um, the final one is a search error. And the search error is basically um, when you are doing what you would like to do is you'd like to find the, um, the output with the highest score. But what you actually do is you have some sort of approximate search algorithm, right? So if you did beam search, uh, then beam search is an approximate search algorithm. So what you have is you have your search. Let's replace this function with search. And these two are not equal. You're not able to find the highest scoring uh, output according to your search algorithm. So if you find something like this, um, it's kind of a mess, right? You know, We have a search algorithm that's not very good for searching for the highest scoring candidate. The highest scoring candidate actually isn't the highest scoring candidate that gives you a good final outcome. And even the way you're measuring your good final outcome kind of is horrible. So you, um, so you have trouble uh, telling whether you're doing a good job in the first place. So welcome to my life as, <laughs> as somebody who, uh, who tries to study these problems. Um, but the good news is you know, a lot of people have recognized these things as problems um, and are trying to fix them and come up with methods to fix them. And um, unfortunately, I think all of these are important problems. Um, the problem is that the great majority of work is spent on trying to come up with different model architectures that fix the model error problem. Um, when there's actually a lot of different ways that you could be fixing these problems in the first place. Um, a lot of people never quantify search error, for example. And a lot of people never even think about evaluation error. So, you know, if I asked you, is word error rate a good metric, everybody kind of looked at me like, I don't know, that's what they told me to optimize, and I'm optimizing my grade in this class, so, you know, um, that's what I have to do. Um, so I'm going to talk about all of these uh, things um, a little bit. I'm mostly going to be talking about um, kind of the connection between model error and training algorithms, but I'm going to also be talking about some other ones uh, as well. So um, one really important thing before I get into that is there are easy ways for you to tell which of these things you're encountering. So the, the easy way um, that you can tell whether you're encountering a search error is by, um, by looking to see you know, if you make your search algorithm more comprehensive, um, whether it's going to be finding um, you know, higher scoring outputs. Uh, there's, a couple ways you can look at whether you're doing a model error, but basically, like, what is the correlation between your model score and your final evaluation score is one thing. You know, are you, um, there are examples where you make your search algorithm better, but actually your, your evaluation score goes down in machine translation. There's a famous example of this. So if that's the case, then you definitely have a model error of some sort. Um, for evaluation error, there are ways that you can model the correlation between your evaluation metrics that you can actually calculate efficiently in human evaluation or downstream task performance. So you basically calculate a bunch of outputs. You calculate the, um, the evaluation score according to like blue score, and then you ask humans to say how good is this translation, and you calculate the correlation between the two. 
Um, are there any questions so far? Yes. Oh, y hat is the result of the argmax. Um, because you're trying to find the output that would maximize your um, that would maximize your evaluation measure. Um, why? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, you are you're absolutely correct. Thank you. Should uh, I should put like y tilde in y tilde here. Is that, is that better? So you're, the y tilde is now the thing you're searching over. So th thank you. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, so I'm going to introduce a few concepts uh, about, called error and risk. Um, let me put this up so I can write. Um, so the idea of error. Um, is uh, basically how bad are you doing at generating outputs? Um, and uh, I'm, as I said, you know, this says translation here, but you can replace it with any sequence generation function. So, um, so generate a um, generate a, an output, and uh, this output will be uh, e hat or y hat, like I, I wrote on the board. And then you want to calculate its badness, like how bad is this output? And Basically, I wrote 1 minus blue here, but this could be 1 minus eval, uh, like I wrote on the board here. Um, so in the end, we want to be minimizing our error. Um, but the problem with minimizing the error, um, the reason why we can't do this is because um, if we are doing the argmax function, like let's say we're searching for an output, um, using the uh, using the search function or the argmax function uh, that I wrote up there, um, the argmax function makes a bunch of discrete uh, zero one decisions, and um, because of this, I, it's maybe not necessarily non or well, it is non differentiable. Um, ReLU is also not smoothly differentiable. Um, uh, you know ReLUs, right? Um, really is not smoothly differentiable, but it's uh, sub-differentiable, uh, which means you can differentiate it almost everywhere. Um, but more importantly, um, ReLU has a non-zero gradient in some places. So ReLU looks like this. Um, so you get a non-zero gradient here. But when you take the argmax, um, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I want to get the highest scoring output given the certain parameters of the model that I have right now. So what you get is you get something that basically looks like this. Let's say you only had one parameter. Um, you had one parameter theta. Um, basically, the moment you change the parameter so much that you get a different uh, result, the um, score of the output will, uh, or the output will change, and thus the score of the output will change, right? Um, so this is called a piecewise constant function, and piecewise constant functions are the functions you definitely don't want to be, you know, doing gradient-based optimization on because they have no gradients; they have no non-zero gradients anywhere. Um, so uh, because of this, um, it's not possible to do um, to do training well. S but fortunately, there is a um, another type of um, function called risk. And risk is basically the expectation of the, um, the expectation of the, uh, of the error. Um, so we can define it like this. And if we have our probabilistic model, um, we uh, then sum over all of the outputs and uh, multiply them by the probability. So Let's say we wanted to minimize the risk um, of a particular input-output pair according to the parameters. You can see that the argmax itself, um, the argmax itself is uh, basically um, non-differentiable, but the risk is not non-differentiable. 
uh, or the risk is not piecewise constant. So the reason why is because you have this probability here. This probability function is not piecewise constant. And you're just multiplying it by the, um, by the error at this point. Um, so this is a differentiable function. And this is something that you could theoretically optimize. So like let's say, um, let's say you're not doing, um, let's say you're not doing structured prediction, but you're rather doing multi-class prediction. So um, let's say you're doing image net classification. And if you're doing image net classification, let's say you had an idea that um, it's really bad to classify a person as a dog. Like that's really, really bad, and you get zero reward for that. But let's say it's not all that bad to classify a golden retriever as a schnauzer, which probably you wouldn't make that mistake very often. But um, you know, uh, if uh, if so, um, you know, let's say that's not something that would be uh, that bad to do. So, if that's the case, basically you have your um, you have a, a big probability vector over all your ImageNet classes. Then you also have an error function here. Um, all you would have to do is you would take the dot product between these two. And that would be, um, that would be your risk. So you could optimize your risk uh, with respect to a, um, uh, a multi-class classification problem easily. Um, however, it's not so simple with a structured prediction problem because, you know, as I said, there's an exponential number or you know infinite number of outputs that you could possibly doing, uh, using, and you can't um, uh, you can't use all of those uh, all of those outputs at the same time. So, minimum risk training um, is a way that you can optimize risk, and basically what this is is this is a um, a way to try to not, um, uh, okay, sorry, one, one more, uh, let me add one more thing. So, like, let's say this is your, um, uh, you know, image net uh, classification, um, classification error uh, that you came up with that says do making mistakes over dogs is not that bad. Um, if you turn this into a zero one, one hot vector, Um, the one hot vector here um, then takes only the probability for the correct class. So this becomes very similar to uh, regular maximum likelihood training. Um, so the um, so because of this, um, basically what you can see is regular maximum likelihood training is um, training an out training a classifier that will try to get the correct answer and will give you absolutely no reward whatsoever for any of the other answers. Um, so that's a good idea if you are trying to evaluate your model with respect to one best accuracy uh, you know, over the whole sequence. It's a bad idea if you're trying to optimize your model with respect to word error rate, for example, which gives you partial credit for getting particular words in the output correct. Um, so what we would like to do is we would like to um, uh, optimize this over uh, real, uh, you know, sequence generation tasks, and the way we can do this is um, instead of trying to enumerate over all of the possible outputs, um, we can rather sample a small number of possible outputs um, and calculate the risk over this small uh, sample. So the way this works is basically we run some sort of uh, algorithm to get a subset of the outputs S. And um, then we calculate the risk. And then we have this Z here. And this Z, what it does is it renormalizes all of the probabilities to sum to 1. And um, this is introduced in, uh, in the Shen et al. Uh, 2016, uh, Minimum Risk Training for Neural Machine Translation. Um, so you can create these samples in one of two different ways. Um, the first way that you can do this is by randomly sampling them according to the probability distribution. The second way is by um, uh, 
The second way is by um, t getting the nBest uh, from your search algorithm and using these nBest. Um, so these two different ways of trying to minimize the risk um, actually correspond to two different uh, ways of trying to optimize your model. So um, when you're trying to optimize the over the end best, basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to ensure that the things that you're, of the things that your search algorithm is likely to find, a good answer comes up to the top. You know, basically you're, you're trying to optimize the, um, kind of approximately optimize the probability that the, um, the best thing that your search algorithm finds is a good output. On the other hand, if you're randomly sampling, um, according to uh, the probability distribution to get the sample, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the whole probability distribution good. So um, to kind of give a conceptual idea of what this looks like, if you're taking the end best, you have all your you know, infinite number of possibilities here. Um, when you take the end best, you're saying, I really only care about the top. I don't care about optimizing the things at the bottom. I can just ignore the order. Um, um, when you're sampling, you're randomly getting things from various places in the probability distribution. And because of this, you're essentially optimizing the whole probability distribution. You're trying to do uh, well overall. So, um, the, um, there's also an idea of adding a temperature term. Um, and the idea of the temperature term basically is to um, down uh, adjust for the fact that we're only getting a small sample. And the idea here is that instead of taking the probabilities um, as is, so instead of taking like the probability of um, 0 0.5 and probability of 0 0.2 and probability of uh, 0 0.02 or something like this, um, you exponentiate this. Uh, with this uh, temperature term here. And the idea behind exponentiating is um, based on your temperature term, you can either make the distribution more peaky or less peaky. You can make it a very smooth distribution that gives lots of probability to all of the outputs, or you can make it a very peaky distribution that gives lots of probability to the top scoring output. And the idea um, behind adding this is basically um, this is a very small sample, so you're likely to be over, um, over predicting the probability of the uh, top scoring one. So it's most common to, um, to make this distribution more smooth. Uh, so like 0 0.3, 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.2, or something like this. Um, during training time, because at test time you're going to be, uh, be have to uh, be searching over you know, a much larger set of the search space. So this is kind of a trick. This is maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit less important. But um, uh, yeah, that's this here. Um, the next question is like, which of these two is better? Um, so I'll have to go in. So up until now, I've been talking about ways to minimize the model error. Um, basically try to take our training algorithm uh, to be so that um, our output more directly um, optimizes the evaluation metric that we're actually evaluating on. So um, you know, one way to do this is to make better models, but I assume you spent a lot of time already talking about making better models. The, um, uh, but I would argue that how you actually optimize the models is kind of equally important. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is like which one of these two is better. And in order to do that, I'm going to have to switch to talking about search errors also. Um, are there any questions so far um, here? Yes. Z, oh, this is a normalization term. So it's, sorry, it's basically the sum of the probabilities uh, raised to the temperature over the sample only. Um, if you had no temperature and if you were summing over everything, then it would just add up to one. Uh, so you wouldn't need to worry about that. But because um, it's a small sample, you, you sum all of them and then renormalize. 
How do you calculate the probability? So the probability is calculated according to your model. So maybe a sequence sequence model, um, uh, like neural neural machine translation, neural you know dialogue generation, um, speech recognition model. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a that's a good point. Um, so, why do you need the probability term here? Um, I'm going to talk about that in a, uh, like mm, I'll talk about something else for a second next, and then I'll, I'll go back to that. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. So. Um, now I'm going to talk about like which one of these things is better. Um, and the answer is it depends. Um, the, and the reason why it depends And actually, I'm sorry, no, I'm still going to be talking about modeling errors uh, now, now that I think about it. And the reason why I'm going to be talking about modeling, like modeling errors according to this definition is I'm going to be talking about how we calculate the score function. And that score function is not necessarily um, just the model probability. So um, maybe this is kind of like a different, uh, a different facet of modeling errors. Um, but basically, um, the problem, as I said, with modeling errors is our model is not, um, is not accurately uh, assessing whether the evaluation metric would be good. And um, there's a concept uh, of decision theory, which is like given a probability distribution, what decision should you be making in the context? And um, so let's assume we have a probability P um, on the board, I'll be consistent and say Y. Um, so P of Y given x, uh, parameterized by theta. Um, so what answer should we be outputting? Um, so the obvious answer, and this is called the, the MAP decision rule, the maximum a posteri posteriori decision rule. Um, Um, is something like this. Um, so what this is saying is I want to output the, um, the output with the highest probability according to the model. So this kind of seems to make sense, right? Um, but there's a, a big problem here, which is what if we have, just to give a, a very simple example, what if we have one output, let's say it's the empty string, Let's say it's just saying, when I take in this input, um, I won't generate any output. I don't feel like generating any output. I'll generate the end of sentence simple immediately. Um, and actually, according to um, neural models, this output tends to get quite high probability. Um, there's actually been a few papers that show that this gets the highest probability out of any, um, out of any output in your output space. However, over here, we have like, um, uh, my, my canine best friend, my dog best friend, my best friend is a dog, et cetera. We have a whole bunch of things over here. And this, this thing over here gets a probability of 0 0.02. And then we have a whole bunch that are like 0 0.01, 0 0.009, uh, 0 0.014, et cetera. So the, we have this kind of outlier over here that's not at all similar to any of the other um, any of the other outputs, and then we have a whole bunch of things that are clustered together that all look kind of good, but you're not quite sure which one it's going to be. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, the empty string the empty string is not the best uh, the best example. A better example would be um, in dialogue generation using neural networks. Um, you basically try to generate a, a response given the current input, 
And the most common response that you get there is, I don't know. So like, what is your name? I don't know. Where are you from? I don't know, et cetera. Um, and that gets a slightly higher probability than just about anything else, because like, if you're not very certain about what the character's name should be, yeah, my name is Bob, my name is Mary, my name is, uh, my name is John, you know, you have this big list of my name is uh, examples. And so it ends up outputting I don't know. So think of this as your I don't know cluster, and think of this as your my name is something cluster over here. So um, there's also something called the minimum Bayes risk uh, decision rule. And the minimum Bayes risk decision rule, basically what it says is you don't want to be outputting the highest probability one, um, but rather you want to be outputting the one that has the minimum risk. Sorry, I don't know why I put P there. The minimum risk. So how do we define risk? Um, the idea of risk is basically, like I said before, it's the expectation of the, um, it's the expectation of the error. And unfortunately, when we're trying to output things, we don't know what the true answer is, right? We don't know, um, we don't know why, we don't know why without any markings. So what we want, what we would like to do is we would like to say, I don't know what the true answer is, but I have an idea about what the answers might be. So the way you calculate the risk in this case is So to put this in words, what you're doing is you're taking all of your possible outputs, um, or maybe your n best list, top n uh, values, and you are calculating the probability of all of them according to your model. And then you're calculating the error of your current hypothesis that you're evaluating with respect to all of the ones in your n best list. So to go back to the conceptual example I had here, what that's going to say is, the error between this and all of the other things in your n best list is going to be really bad, right? You know, it's way far away. It's going to have an error of nearly one. Whereas all of these things, because they're very similar, are going to have a very low error. Um, so what that means is you'll probably end up picking something in this cluster uh, because, you know, the distance between this cluster and uh, this thing over here is quite large. So you'll kind of like aggregate the probability over all things in that cluster. Um, so there's kind of a nice conceptual explanation for this, and also mathematically, this is minimizing the the risk, which is something that uh, we know is um, a good thing in uh, um, in you know probability theory, etc. So this is a really important concept, and um, there's been quite a few papers recently on um, on like examining uh, you know, search algorithms and like how you generate things from big language models like GPT-2 uh, and stuff like this. And I think um, currently the way people generate, uh, generate things from language models is by like randomly sampling things with some restrictions on the sample space, et cetera. And I think part of the reason why is because people aren't thinking about like um, things from a point of view of decision theory and saying, you know, what is the best thing that I could use to minimize my risk? And if you take the maximum probability output, the maximum probability output might be something like, I don't know. But, you know, if, um, you know, if you have the concept of risk and say, I, 
you know, I don't know might have high probability, but it's very dissimilar to all the other things that have high probability. Then I think simply by doing something like this, you could, you know, solve a lot of these uh, these problems. Um, so going back to this uh, that I talked about over here, which is better to optimize? I think basically the answer about what what is better to optimize. I haven't substantiated this with experimental evidence, but kind of intuitively. What is better to optimize will depend on how you're doing your search. So if you want a good probability distribution over all of the, uh, over all of the probabilities, if at, then probably at search time, um, you know, if you're doing some sort of risk-based decoding objective, especially if you're sampling while, um, while calculating this risk-based objective, probably sampling during training time is going to be better. But if you're just trying to maximize the highest scoring uh, thing and you're doing kind of the argmax um, or maximum posteriori decision rule, then uh, you might want to be picking the end best. And like people have done both um, in uh, in training these models, uh, and it probably depends on wh what you're going to be doing at uh, at actual uh, output generation time. Um, are there any questions here? Yes. So beam search, traditional beam search, yes, it definitely is. That's not a good technique for finding a good Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's a couple things to say here. So this is a very good question. So beam search, beam search is a search algorithm um, that will attempt to maximize a score. Um, and if your score, is the log likelihood of your model, then it's trying to optimize the log likelihood of your model. You take the, if you take the one best output in there, then that will be maximizing the argmax, and it might not be good. However, we still need to generate outputs in some way, right? Um, so the um, one way you can generate outputs, even if you're using the risk-based objective, is to do beam search take your end best list from beam search and reorder um, the end best, rescore the end best list from beam search using this risk based objective. Um, there are other ways you can do it. So like you could try intentionally break your beam search so that it doesn't give you the best output, but gives you more diver diversity in the output. And if you get, get more diversity in the output, maybe this, um, uh, this risk based uh, objective would be lower in the end. So one of, the, one of the good reasons why having an idea of a decoupling between search error and model error and evaluation error is um, your search algorithm is what is in charge of optimizing your, basically, um, your score. So it's in charge of optimizing your score where, in this case, your score is the probability. In this case, your score is the risk. Um, and what you can do is you can run beam search and say, you know, when I'm running with a beam of five, do I get a good model score? When I'm running with a beam of 10, do I get a good model score here? Um, and empirically, from what I've seen, actually beam search is pretty good at optimizing just the likelihood of neural you know, autoregressive models. It, it does a pretty good job of finding the highest scoring hypothesis. However, once you start want, wanting to optimize the risk, it will be harder, right? You'll have to generate a more diverse output set. You might need a bigger beam because you're doing risk scoring or something like that. But that's great because then you can optimize, you can optimize your search algorithm to get a better model score and then measure the correlation between the model score and the evaluation metric that you're actually trying to uh, optimize. Whereas if you, don't think about these separately. You might say, oh, I made my beam larger and my results got worse. What should I do? I don't know what to do. Um, uh, you know, I made my search algorithm better. It's finding better model, you know, better model score. Like, what, what should I do to fix this problem? Um, so having a division of labor between these uh, is uh, pretty important. And actually, there's a, um, a nice paper.
called, um, can you see that there? I guess not. Called um, Six Challenges for Neural Machine Translation. Um, and they have an example in here. They have an example in here where basically the dark green one is um, the dark green one is when they did beam search and they made their beam larger and larger. The x-axis is the size of the beam. And you can see the blue score going up for a little bit and then it suddenly starts to go down. Um, and one way to fix this is by adding heuristics, like dividing the, um, the length of the, um, not optimizing for the actual probability here, but optimizing for the probability divided by the length of the sentence. Um, and they, they added that, um, and that kind of fixed the problem in some cases, but still you make your, um, your model, uh, you're being bigger and it starts to go down in the end. And this is completely heuristic, right? This has no probabilistic, uh, sorry. Actually, I shouldn't use Z there. I should use the length of the output. This has no probabilistic interpretation. It has nothing to do with anything we know in machine learning theory or whatever. Um, so by thinking of this as you know, like a modeling problem instead of a, um, a search problem that can uh, also help you. And there's also, I don't, mean to, I don't mean to pick on this paper. It's kind of a, it's a nice paper in some ways, but Um, there's also this, this paper recently um, that discusses similar problems with, uh, with language models. And the idea is basically they, um, they run beam search to optimize the, um, the probability here. And they say, with the language model um, that optimizes the beam search objective, um, we find that it repeats all the time. It repeats outputs uh, very frequently. Um, so I think that it's a reasonable point. The model that they're using has been optimized to just maximize the likelihood. It has no concept of evaluation during the optimization. Um, they're also not using a minimum base risk uh, style decoding strategy, they're rather using um, just the argmax here. Um, the, I feel like one of the problems with this paper is that they then decide to come up with a bunch of heuristics to break the search algorithm, to make the search algorithm wrong and get more search errors. Um, and then empirically they show that this does a bit better at generating results that look natural. But now, you know, what are we, what are we trying to optimize? What is our goal in the end of, uh, of doing a good job of uh, modeling? And once you start to like, rely on broken search algorithms that can't actually optimize your model score, then you'll have trouble. You, know, you come up with a better model. Um, the model has fewer model errors, but your search algorithm is bad, so you don't figure out a, a good way to fix that. So um, I, I think this is an important uh, thing to be talking about or thinking about when you're uh, designing your, your methods. Um, are there any questions about this? OK. So um, let's see. OK, so um, I'm going to go through um, another uh, example. So re reinforcement learning. Um, there's lots of different varieties of reinforcement learning. Um, but uh, kind of on a high level, um, did, did you talk about reinforcement learning related stuff here to some extent? Did you talk about reinforce? Um, did you talk about value, uh, like value-based reinforcement learning, like deep Q learning or no? OK. Um, that's good, because I'm not going to talk about it either. So, um, so ba but basically, I'll, I'll go through this quickly then. Um, so in supervised learning, you're given the correct uh, decisions 
And um, very often we optimize the, uh, the log probability of the uh, correct outputs. Um, in the context of reinforcement learning, this is also called imitation learning. So you have a, a teacher, and that teacher, you try to mimic the actions of a teacher. Um, hence also the name teacher forcing. Um, so another concept is uh, self-training. And self-training, basically the idea here, is um, that you want to take a sample or argmax, usually argmax according to the current model, um, and then you use that sample to maximize the likelihood. Um, and so basically what, the only difference between this and supervised learning is in supervised learning we have the correct answer here. In self-training we, um, we have uh, the generated output. So this is simple enough. It also doesn't need any correct answer um, because you can just generate the output and, uh, and um, you can just generate the output and use it. But um, is it a good idea? Does this seem like, uh, seem like a good idea to do this? Can anyone see any problems with this? Mm -hmm. Well, so actually the argmax up here might make a mistake because this is according to the current model. So um, in, in fact, that's actually kind of the problem. So the problem here is that the, um, uh, the current model might make mistakes, right? So if you make mistakes, you generate things, you train to maximize the likelihood, you're just going to be reinforcing your errors. Um, Interestingly, this is not always a bad thing to do. Um, sometimes uh, if you have a really, really large uh, set of data that you don't have actual gold standard outputs for, um, then if your model is sufficiently good, um, it will get it right most of the time. And then self-training can actually uh, work to some extent. Um, also. Recently, specifically with respect to machine translation for high, uh, high resource languages or domains, um, sometimes your model is better than the translators who created the original data in the first place. Um, so uh, in those cases, you can actually see benefits from something like this. Um, but usually you need some other way to reinforce, um, uh, reinforce the model uh, working well. And one common thing is uh, co-training. Um, so co-training was it, um, uh, basically the idea is you train multiple um, models and you only take the places where the two models agree. Or you train multiple models, you ensemble them together, and uh, you, uh, you only take the places where, you, or you take the outputs of the ensemble or something like this. So this kind of gets around the, uh, the problem because now your outputs are better uh, than the outputs of any single model. Um, so you can look at policy gradient or reinforce from this point of view as well. So policy gradient um, is actually very similar to self-training in that you are um, taking a term that scales the loss by the reward. So actually, sorry, this, this is a typo. That should be L reinforce, and you need the Y, um, the reference Y on the left side. Um, but basically what this is doing is it's not just optimizing the, uh, the likelihood of the output, but it's also multiplying it by the reward. Um, so outputs with a bigger reward will get a higher weight. Um, and you can show that this converges to the minimum risk solution uh, by working through all of the math. Um, an interesting thing to think about is under what conditions is this equivalent to maximum likelihood, uh, um, maximum likelihood estimation? It's conditions on R. Any ideas? Were you raising hand? R Y hat comma Y. Then this becomes one. So so that means like when we have the correct completely correct. Right. So basically 
When R is defined as the zero one loss, so in other words, you, you get a loss of zero whenever, or you get an error, if we put it the other way, you get an error of zero when you're correct, and you get a error of one otherwise, um, basically this will, uh, this will converge to maximum likelihood estimation. So you can see that reinforce is kind of an instantiation of, um, it's a, a generalization of maximum likelihood estimation that allows you to consider um, some sort of evaluation function in your training. Um, so, Yeah, I'll, I'll skip that part uh, in the interest of time. So um, one problem with uh, minimum risk training and reinforcement learning is that it's, uh, it's actually quite hard to get it to work properly. Um, so this is the right thing to do, and I believe we should be doing this. I've had a lot of success in applying this um, uh, in you know, optimizing systems, et cetera. Um, it obviates the needs for heuristics. So instead of coming up with heuristics that break your search algorithm to try to make your re results better, it will actually give you a theoretically a good way for optimizing systems. Um, but the problem with it is that um, in general, sampling-based methods tend to be unstable because you're only considering a very small subset of the, uh, of the outputs in y you know, your loss Sorry, that's the decoding objective. But you're only considering a very small number of the outputs. Um, and for example, if there's no good output in the entire uh, you know, sample that you have here, you're not going to be able to learn anything. Um, it's particularly unstable uh, when using a bigger vocabulary space. So like, let's say you have uh, 10,000 uh, words in your vocabulary. That's going to be hard. Um, you might not have to try very hard if you only have two choices, for example. So like, let's say. Um, let's say you wanted to do a summarization task where for every word in the, um, in the input you need to decide whether to keep it or not keep it. That would be relatively easy because you only have two choices for each and um, you, know, you probably could just use a regular reinforce uh, style algorithm to solve something like that. Um, however, there's a number of strategies that you can use to stabilize. So um, one of them is uh, adding a baseline um, you probably heard about this when you talked about reinforce, or no? The, ba the baseline for reinforce? I see some people looking confused, so um, uh, I, I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, so basically, um, <clears throat> the idea of a baseline is that um, when you optimize models using, using reinforce, you have the reward function. Um, but some examples are inherently easier than others. So uh, let's say you have, uh, this, this is an easy sentence. Uh, let's say that was your source and you want to generate an, uh, a translation for it, for example. And then you also have the sentence, uh, buffalo, 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 which is actually a grammatical English sentence. You can look it up on Wikipedia if you don't believe me. Um, but you probably could not translate that uh, appropriately. Um, so let's say you, you fed these into your system um, and you got a reward of 0 0.8 for the first one and you got a reward of 0 0.3 for the second one. It looks like you did better on the first one um, and worse on the second one, but in reality, the first one's super easy, so you expect that you should do a good job. The second one's hard, so you expect that you shouldn't do a good job. So what we have is basically uh, something called a baseline, which expresses our a priori expectation of how well we're going to do on that example. Um, so what we do is we do the, I think, sorry, that's a typo also. It should be R minus B. So we have the reward minus the baseline, and this ends up being the final reward that we feed into reinforce. Um, so basically on the first one, despite the fact that we did well, we underperformed our expectation. For the second one, despite the fact that we did poorly, we overperformed our expectation. So, um, so basically, it looks like this. And instead of um, uh, doing the, uh, instead of multiplying by the reward, we multiply by the reward minus the baseline. Um, so there's a number of different ways we could calculate the baseline. Um, 
the original paper uh, by Ranzato et al. who did this, um, uh, which is like sequence level training for neural, uh, for neural networks or neural machine translation. Um, they had a model that basically predicted the baseline value. So this is a model that takes in the, um, the uh, output of the encoder or the decoder and tries to predict this value of the baseline. And that's trained to accurately predict the reward that you're going to get for the sentence. Um, another way that I've used recently that's actually a little bit easier to implement is just um, calculating a mini batch and taking the average of the reward over the mini batch or over uh, multiple outputs for the sentence. So basically this is saying, you know, given your current model, are you doing better than you do on average uh, right now? Or are you doing uh, worse than you do on average right now? And the good thing about that is like if you have things, sentences of similar length in the mini batch, then it will normalize over the length. Um, or if you're using the same sentence, you can just take the average performance for that sentence and try to upweight good uh, ones and downweight bad ones. Oh, actually, sorry, yeah, that's what I had on my next slide. So. Um, uh, another thing that you can do to try to stabilize uh, training in these is increasing the batch size. Um, so the reason why increasing the batch size is good is because each sample uh, that we get by using just this limited number of hypotheses is high variance. And because of this, um, what we can do instead is we can sample many different examples before performing an update. So instead of updating on a single sentence at a time, we update on 32 sentences or 64 sentences or something like this. Um, the only problem with this is this makes training a little bit slower, but you know that's uh, what a price you have to pay. Um, yeah. Um, another thing that you can do is you can save um, previous examples and reuse them when we uh, update parameters. Um, this is something called experience replay. And the reason why this is good is um, when training goes bad, uh, I can show you uh, what happens. So when training, um, when training the, according to um, methods to optimize your evaluation score goes poorly, um, what can happen is that basically the model uh, crashes and starts uh, outputting really bad things uh, every single time. And an example of this is in uh, this paper on minimum risk training. And they show, um, they do a nice ablation of the hyperparameters and they find one hyperparameter. This is basically their temperature, uh, temperature hyperparameter that I talked about before. Um, when you set it incorrectly, basically the model crashes and it just doesn't output anything, um, anything uh, good at all. So the problem is when you get down here, basically every single output in your, um, in your end best list is going to be garbage. So there's no way to recover from this state. So what experience replay allows you to do is it basically allows you to keep around some examples from um, like previous iterations of the training. And this ensures that you never get to a state where you have uh, you know, all bad examples in here. Um, another thing that's really essential if you're training over large vocabularies is warm start. Um, this is not absolutely necessary. Uh, you don't need to, there are some methods recently that don't require you to do this. But it, it's very convenient, which is what you do is you start training with maximum likelihood then you switch over to some other uh, structured training algorithm. And you can either do this by just training maximum likelihood to convergence, or you can have some sort of annealing schedule uh, where you basically start out 100% you know, maximum likelihood, then gradually introduce um, more of the training objective. Um, so this uh, works only in scenarios where you can actually run um, maximum likelihood estimation. So this works for like neural sequence generation things where you know the gold standard sequence, but it won't work for things like, um, uh, you know, learning from a very delayed reward. So one example would be um, if you have a dialogue system and you want that dialogue system to help people reserve plane tickets or something like that. And your final reward is whether they reserved a plane ticket or not. 
there you don't know if the intermediate things you did are actually the right thing to do. You just know whether you sold a plane ticket at the end. And in that, a case like that, something like warm start um, might not be possible unless you can you know, hire a bunch of people to actually sell plane tickets for you and use that as gold standard uh, training data. Um, so anyway, um, uh, if you want a reference for this, uh, Ron Zato et al., uh, the paper that I just actually mentioned, um, uh, gradually transitions from maximum likelihood estimation to the, the full objective. So this is uh, one example you can see of that. Um, are there any questions about these things uh, here? OK. So um, <clears throat> uh, one final thing that I'd like to talk about is um, this evaluation error. Um, and this is a really big um, this is a really big problem in um, any sort of task that has lots of uh, lots of variation um, in the outputs. So, a example of a task that doesn't have very much variation is speech recognition. So, speech recognition. If you asked ten people to ten native speakers of the language who are trained in transcription to listen to a utterance and transcribe it, their mutual word error rate would probably be two, three. You know, they, they would likely come up with very similar transcriptions, except you, maybe one person would write it's, one person would write it is, um, or something like this. You'd have minor errors. However, for translation, if you ask 10 skilled professional translators, they would all generate a different translation, right? However, that's still one of the better examples, which is if you asked 10 people, how are you doing today? Um, OK, that, sorry, that's not a good example because everyone would probably say, I'm fine. But like, let's say, um, uh, what, is, uh, what did you do this weekend um, would be one example. There's a million different correct answers to that, right? Um, so you could have all these different um, uh, you know, answers for that, uh, for that, and it would be difficult to, um, you know, say there's a single correct answer. Um, other examples, generating news articles from, uh, from basketball scores. Um, coming up with copy to try to sell a product. These are all things that seem like, you know, they'd be interesting to try with neural networks, uh, but they're very difficult to evaluate. And because of this, you know, many of our metrics right now result in, um, rely on, whether the words match the words in an output that a human generated. And if that's the case, it becomes really, really hard. And there's actually um, uh, examples of evaluation for dialogue systems where they have uh, like blue score, um, blue score and human evaluation. And it's like, This. Like it's completely decorrelated between these uh, overlap metrics and the actual quality of the output according to humans. Um, so this is a major problem, and if you don't think about this, you're not like if you're making a practical system, it's really important to think about this. Um, one way you can get around this is try to come up with a better reference-based evaluation metric. So a better evaluation metric that takes in a reference, takes in an output. And, um, and tries to match them together. Um, a recent example of this is uh, something called uh, BERT score, which, you know, if you're familiar with natural language processing, you know you have to do everything with BERT nowadays. It's kind of a rule. Um, so they, uh, they basically um, evaluate uh, text generation with BERT. So they take the output of BERT and try to match it together. And they show that this works better than blue and other things on a variety of tasks. And um, we also have a paper um, that further takes a metric that's not exactly BERT score, but it's um, uh, um, it's not exactly BERT score, but it's a, a metric of semantic similarity between the two outputs. And we actually use this in training the model. So we use this as our reward in minimum risk training as opposed to um, you know, a standard reward. 
And this, um, we show that this results in better human outputs. So this is another thing where basically we're going all the way from end to end. We're coming up with a better evaluation metric that does uh, better here. Um, we uh, you know, reduce the model error by training with respect to this. Um, we use beam search. I'm sorry, we can't do everything at once, but you know, <laughs> uh, we use regular beam search at the end. But um, yeah. So um, that's all the time I have. Uh, hopefully, this was a, a good uh, overview that um, gives you some things to think about if you're generating sequences. So, um, are there any final questions uh, before we finish up? Okay. Well, thanks a lot then.